This time we look at five motorcycling fails. Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Now whether it's the result of insufficient money, bad design or bad timing, failure is always an option in the motorcycle industry. So with that in mind, here's five motorcycling fails. The BMW K1 The K-series BMWs are tough engines. They're extremely reliable and well developed, but they're not perfect. The engine is somewhat compromised because they had to get an inline four cylinder engine mounted horizontally in the frame. Now to do this, they needed to run a fairly narrow bore, otherwise the engine would have been too long. But also they could make the engine too wide because it would affect ground clearance because they wanted to mount the engine quite low in the frame. To achieve this, they fitted the engine with rather short conrods and this would result in primary vibration. And this would affect the whole K100 family, although not the K75s incidentally, the three cylinder bikes, because they fitted a balance shaft to those to cancel it out. Now the K1 was a development of the earlier K100 series. It used a 16 valve head to replace the old 8 valve head of the, the original 4s and developed quite a bit more power. Although interestingly BMW pegged this to just 100 horsepower voluntarily. Instead of the claim 90 of the original K100, it was also quite a bit heavier and it was very long which gave the machine a turning circle of around 22 feet so nimble it certainly wasn't so how were BMW going to achieve high speeds from essentially what was by the standards of the day a fairly heavy and underpowered machine they were going to do it the clever way they were going to use aerodynamics but advanced aerodynamics will compromise your design and in the K1 it resulted in slightly iffy performance in a crosswind. You can just imagine what happens when a strong wind hits that huge fender at the front. But the other main problem that it caused was excess heating. It didn't allow heat to escape from the bike. And this could make running at speeds below 50 miles an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, really uncomfortable, particularly on earlier models. To cure this, BMW added heat resistant padding under the bodywork. Now this did at least make the ride a little bit more comfortable, but it never completely cured the fact the bike was running rather hot at low speeds. In the end, of course, BMW did the sensible thing and put the 16 valve on the old K100RS. This at least would provide you a more comfortable riding position and it didn't look quite so odd. Certainly one of the main problems with this bike is it really is a very much a Marmite design. Some people really love the styling and those very bright colors. Many people, not so much. On the bright side though, it at least encourage BMW to develop the S1000 and that's a very different machine. OEC and their oddly engineered contraption. The Osborne Engineering Company was formed in 1906 by Frederick J. Osborne and obviously after a few years he began producing motorcycles like so many bicycle and other engineers in Britain around that time but his machines were somewhat unusual. OK, he used proprietary Jap engines like many producers in the 20s and 30s and proprietary gearboxes and many other parts were proprietary also. However, OEC really liked to dabble in the unusual. They really liked to push boundaries and try out new designs. And that's not always a good idea in the motorcycle market. And the tendency to do things differently often gave them the moniker oddly engineered contraptions. Probably their best known unusual idea was the duplex steering chassis. Now the duplex steering system in some ways kind of reminds me of the telelever system that BMW used for a while. And it does have a number of problems. Although it gave great stability, in any system where there's linkages there's always a slight vagueness in the steering which many riders really don't appreciate. Also the amount of steering lock that the bike could give was greatly reduced compared to other machines and it was said 
that the frames could ground out. Although, to be honest, I think the bikes would have to be cranked over quite a way before this actually happened. From the tyres used in the 1930s, I can't imagine the ground clearance was too big of a problem, to be honest. Where the frame really did work well was its straight line stability, and this made it ideal for speed record braking, because usually you're only going in a straight line anyway. However, the bike buying public, particularly in Britain, are a fairly conservative lot. It came down to, it looks a little bit too strange, so we're not going to buy it. So the system was unfortunately a commercial failure, and OEC went into receivership in 1931. And I know it would soon be resurrected, by 1936, it was all over for OEC. The Norton Jubilee 250 Norton's Jubilee is one of those bikes that kind of frustrates, because it should have been really quite good. The new 250 was introduced in 1958, which was the year that Norton commemorated their Diamond Jubilee, hence the name. It was designed by Bert Hopwood, which should have been a promising start, and was based roughly around the earlier Navigator, and was in fact Norton's first unit construction engine, ultimately be their only unit construction engine. Well, that reached full scale production at least. Right from the beginning, there were problems with the bike and it developed a fairly poor reputation for reliability. He redesigned the crankshaft and redesigned the gearbox lace shaft bush and this did improve the situation somewhat. But the other big problem was that by this point AMC owned Norton and they wanted to produce the bike at the minimum possible cost. So what they effectively did was bung the all new engine in what was basically a Francis Barnett frame. AMC also fitted the transmission from their lightweight two-stroke machines, so that must have been reliable. With new learner laws restricting motorcyclists on L plates to 250 cc, the 250 capacity now became a big seller and a very important class in the British market. So the Jubilee really should have been more successful than it was. Most of its competitors were single cylinder bikes after all, and to be honest, the Norton sounds an awful lot cooler. But those poor quality issues, the fact that it wasn't really a Norton frame and the fact that you had to rev the nuts off the thing to really get any performance out of it really didn't help matters. And of course it wasn't particularly cheap either. Norton would stick with the design and take it out to 350cc for the Navigator and later now on 400cc for the Electra. And these were pretty good machines but it did take Norton a little while to refine the design. Sales of the Jubilee itself were always a little bit disappointing, and it was a bike that in sales terms at least, somewhat underachieved. The Hesketh V1000. This is motor racing legend James Hunt. Now his first win came with the Hesketh Motor Racing Company, set up by Alexander the Third Lord Hesketh in the 1970s. However, it soon became apparent the Formula 1 was getting just too darn expensive, even for landed gentry, so he decided to revive the British motorcycle industry. Initially he courted Triumph, because he simply didn't have the production facilities to mass produce a machine. The Triumph were in no fit state to get involved with Lord Hesketh and develop a completely new machine. They were pretty much on the way down by this point. So he developed a machine of his own, the V1000. Problem was, he didn't really have the money to successfully complete the design and when the machine hit the roads, it was not finished. The bike made use of a direct overhead cam V twin engine with four valves per cylinder, which was the first on a production British motorcycle. Some of the engine design work was done by engineering genius Harry Wesley, but despite this, there were a lot of issues with that motor, mainly around production and build quality, and the fact that the companies assembling the engines simply didn't communicate properly. For example, the company making the pistons were not aware that the engine ran backwards, so the thrust surfaces were on the wrong side on the pistons. This, and a poorly designed primary drive, resulted in a very noisy engine mechanically, a long way from the prestigious Bruff Superior look that the company was going for. A great deal of work was done to solve these problems, well at least most of them, before production bikes were actually built. But this took time, and time cost money. And after only 149 bikes were actually completed, unfortunately, Hesketh went to the war, but being plucky Brits they picked themselves up, did some more work on the bike, got it back into production and um, went bankrupt again. 
However, in 1982, Nick Broom, who'd been one of the development engineers and the test rider on the bike, began production under the banner of Nick Broom Engineering in very small scale production. But in 2011, after completing more than 300 motorcycles, Broom sold the company on and went into semi retirement. And that was pretty much the end for the Hesketh V1000 Sports Tourer. But whether it really had appealed to the bike buyer of the 1980s is really open to question. Royal Enfield's Continental GT. No, not the new one, the original 250 learner bike from the mid-60s. Now there's no doubt that this is a very handsome looking machine. And it performed pretty well by British 250 standards at the time, although it was slower than the Japanese bikes that were now creeping in. The other problem with Royal Enfield was the machine was rather expensive, costing more than the equivalent CB77 Honda, but it did look great. And it was the first British bike to feature a 5-speed gearbox. And the problems with this bike really did lie with that gearbox. The selector mechanism was far from perfect. After all, they were trying to squeeze a lot of very tiny gears into a limited space, originally designed for a four-speeder. This meant that the machine didn't select very well and was rather vague in selection, and could jump out of gear, particularly top. Now, my uncle actually owned one of these during the 60s and absolutely loved it, apart from the gearbox, which he did say was bloody awful. In fact, Riding at speed, he would often have to leave his foot pressed down on the gear change to hold it in top gear. In the end, he whipped the engine out and fitted a Honda CB77 motor in because the Enfield looked loads better than the CB77, but the motor was an awful lot better on the Honda. Envy Augusta's 750S Envy Augusta was the most successful Grand Prix racing team pretty much in history. 37 World Championships, I believe. Envy Augusta did, of course, make some road machines, but they didn't make any four-cylinder sports bikes. And many people in the company pushed the owner of the company, Count Domenico Augusta, into producing his own four-cylinder superbike. The Count was very unwilling to do so because he felt that uh, privateers would use the bike against him in racing. So he allowed them to develop a 600cc touring shaft drive bike. I have to say this is not one of the prettiest bikes ever to come out of Italy. In fact, it's pretty ugly. But eventually, the Count did relent. Grand Prix racing was beginning to dry up by the mid-70s as two-stroke invasion had begun and the MV was getting somewhat out of date. So the company did need to diversify and try something different. The result was the 750S and 750S America. This is an extremely handsome machine. It's absolutely beautiful. In fact, it made our list of most beautiful bikes in the world. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was fairly predictable. It was built in tiny numbers, so it was eye-wateringly expensive. The company needed to cut costs somehow. How did they do that? Well, they used cheap electrical connections, making the bike unreliable, and the chrome fell off. Envy Augusta never really got to grips with mass marketing. The machine was flawed, although beautiful, and so it never really sold. People spent a fraction of the money to buy a Honda 750, which at least they knew would be reliable and well built. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.